All right, and we are live. <laughs> uh, Dominic Maitri, everyone. Um, Dom, thank you. Thank you for coming. Um, you and I went to college together. And, uh, and before we went to college together, I actually met you at an international meet. It was, it was the European Championships in 2001. And, uh, and I ran into an American coach that was coaching in Switzerland. And, uh, and he, you know, he, I didn't know you then, but, you know, he said that, you know, he had a guy that, uh, that could potentially go, go to college, uh, go, to, go to Cal. And, uh, and, and the first question was, well, does this guy speak English? <laughs> he's like, <laughs> all Swiss people speak English, you know, but he's, uh, he actually lives in South Africa. Now, um, I, 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 I mentioned to, uh, to, to our membership um, that, you know, you've had quite the experience. Uh, your, your father uh, worked for an airline company for Swiss Air. Was that yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Back in and, the days, uh, Swiss Air, yep. And, uh, and, and you spent, you know, much of your childhood living abroad. Uh, you were in Hong Kong and South Africa and in Switzerland before you came to the States. Um, you know, uh, how, where were you born? I mean, tell, tell us where you were born and how you started swimming and yeah. where. Yeah, let, let, let me take it back a little bit. So um, both my parents are Swiss. Um, I'm all, I was born in Switzerland. However, I've never lived there. Uh, okay. That needs to be said. So. My dad used to work for an airline and it was just kind of company policy in the position that he was in that he would or his family would be transferred every four to six years. So um, at the time, my parents were living in Athens, Greece. And Not bad. Um, my mom and dad went back to give birth to me in Switzerland. And um, I basically spent the first two years of my life in Athens, Greece. Um, and then um, we moved to, uh, back then it was called Zaire, which is today's Democratic Republic of Congo. It's very, very central Africa. Um, spent a good four years there. From there, we moved to um, Southern California, moved to Manhattan Beach down here in, L in Los Angeles, which was quite oh, the change okay. from, from central Africa. Um, <laughs> and that's, well, I, let me take a step back here. I think in, when I lived in central Africa, we had a pool in our in our kind of backyard and as a kind of a safety precaution my parents enrolled me in swim classes at a local country club and um that's how i kind of got my feet wet um and I, that's how i kind of got the whole um swimming bug a little bit i i it was more of a safety thing originally than it was kind of a, a sport that would you know take me throughout my life um, as is for most people yeah. yeah. Right. And that's, uh, that's something that I'm doing with my own kids too, right now. Right. I just want to get them kind of introduced to water. And so they're not scared of water. Um, you know, the USA swimming foundation, um, has a very, very scary, um, statistic with, you know, kids drowning. And so, and that's a, that's a problem that, you know, throughout the world and the U S equally. Um, but once I got, to, once I got stateside down here in Southern California and lived in Madden beach <clears throat> back then, and, Anyone that's a little bit older on this call uh, will re remember Baywatch was a real big hit back then. And um, yeah. there was this lady called CJ Parker played by uh, Pamela Anderson. And I thought, yeah. oh my gosh, if she's a lifeguard, I want to be a lifeguard, right? Yeah. So that's how yeah. I got into kind of junior lifeguards. Um, and I loved it. I loved every summer I would do junior lifeguards. Now, during the year, I, w I would just train because I had a really bad experience um, where at a swim meet, it was a 50 breast, 50 yard breaststroke, two laps of the pool. And I thought it was just a 25 breast. And so I got out and then everyone was kind of yelling, no, get back in, get back in, you know, swim again. And I was just kind of terrified with the whole thing. And because everyone was yelling and screaming that I just did not want to compete. I just wanted to be with my friends from that point onwards and train with them, but I didn't want to compete because I was just scared. So you uh, started club swimming or was it like a summer league thing? In it, was, it was a club thing because my, what my parents, so you, for junior guards, and I'm sure it's very similar these days too, is you have to go a certain qualifying time to, in order to participate. Mm -hmm. And in order to set myself up for success, my parents were very smart and they're like, Hey, look, if you want to do this, let's not just dilly dally. Let's enroll you in, you know, a swim club or, or a swim team 
so that you can learn how to swim properly and you'll build up the stamina to swim the hundred yard freestyle or whatever it was back in the day. Yeah. Um, so that's how I kind of got started. How old were you, how old were you when you kind of um, dove into that? I want to say probably like eight, nine or 10, 11 in that kind of age. Okay. Um, but again, it was, it was just more for fun. It wasn't super serious by any means. Yeah. Um, through over time. And this is, I kind of learned this after, uh, when I got a little older, but my, my club coach at that time basically told my parents like, Hey, look, just let him keep having fun swimming. That's the most important thing. If he doesn't want to compete, that's absolutely fine. Right. That's and awesome. I feel like it was this kind of master plan because, <laughs> um, I think once a year that local club would host a swim meet. And so one year I thought I was just going to swim practice, but it was a swim meet all of a sudden again. And um, they enrolled me in a couple races and my coach at the time just said, Hey, just swim these races, see how it goes. And very similar to a lot of other people that, you know, you've kind of talked to over this past week, success sometimes brings a little bit of, you know, a little bit more drive, a little, you know, everyone wants a little bit more once they have this little bit of taste of success. Right. And I was very similar to that. So I wasn't great, but you know, I think I got top three, I think maybe got third in the 50 breaststroke and um, yeah, it was basically the highlight. And I was like, okay, this, you know, this is kind of fun. It's kind of fun getting a ribbon. <laughs> you know? um, yeah. And so that kind of progressed and, and just to can, kind of continue um, kind of the, the swimming journey um, after my time in, in the States, I, we got transferred to Hong Kong. And um, that was quite the big culture shock for, for myself, obviously, with European roots coming from the United States into an Asian country. Um, it was very different um, than I had expected. Um, I'd, 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 I'd continued swimming there. And that was the one nice thing that I always liked about swimming. No matter where you are in the world, you could always compare yourself to other people because time is consistent, right? Yeah. One second here is one is the same as in Australia or in Japan or in Europe. It doesn't matter where. Um, where are some other, you know, judging sports, you know, politics gets involved a little bit. Something is a little more black and white, maybe not in your case with the finish there. Um, yeah. But it, it, in the grand scheme of things, it's, it's, it's awesome to be able to, you can always compare yourself to other people. Now I'm not saying compare yourself, but it's always, an, it's always a good idea to measure yourself to see what other people are doing because it might drive you or whatnot, you know? So you swam in Hong Kong. Uh, I swam you in Hong a club Kong. there? I found a club there. Yeah. So I went to a German Swiss international school over there and um, there were a couple, a couple of Europeans over there that were also swimming. And they're like, Hey, we're, we're part of this swim club right here. You know, you, you might want to join, which I did. Now, something that <clears throat> you didn't mention, but I think uh, should be mentioned is when I was living in Hong Kong, once a year, the school would go on a ski trip to Switzerland. Um, obviously being Swiss and everything, I was like, yeah, this is awesome. Let's go on a ski trip with, you know, some of my classmates. And this was during a time where I was swimming, you know, for fun, but it wasn't, you know, like a job or anything like that. You know, my parents let me play all kinds of sports. Um, so I went to Switzerland and the second year that I went back for that ski trip, um, I actually had a pretty tragic accident where I broke my hip. Um, I broke my hip, uh, broke my left hip and needed immediate surgery, um, which was a little scary because it was in the French part of Switzerland. My French wasn't very good. Obviously, I was with, a, with an international school there, so that made things a little bit more um, scary. You know, we had to call, the surgeon had to call my parents to ask for permission to operate on me, and with the time difference, it was a call in the middle of the night, so, you know, it was kind of crazy for my parents. Um, but without getting too much into detail, I had some complications about nine months after my surgery. Um, the, my hip joint had kind of died or collapsed, which created more complications. And at which point um, the doctor basically said, hey, look, you're probably never going to be able to swim or, you know, run or, or walk properly again. Um, fortunately, um, I was able to prove him wrong. Um, Throughout my recovery, I did a lot of kind of a water aerobics um, because water is actually really good for physical therapy in regards to movement because mm -hmm. there's no, um, it's, it's not an impact sport by any means. Um, 
But in terms of, you know, making lemonade out of lemons, um, what I basically did was when I couldn't kick and push off walls and everything like that, I just, I pulled. I put a pull buoy between my legs and just pulled every single time and then would touch the wall and just push off with, you know, kind of do a regular, not a flip or anything, but just touch, turn around and keep going. And so my upper body started getting super, super strong. And once the doctor said, okay, you know, you, you can start putting full pressure on your hip again. Um, I started slowly, gradually, gradually start kicking and working my way, working my legs back up into shape. Um, but How old were you when that happened? I was 13. Yeah. I was 13. And it was a little bit scary because they were talking about artificial hips and all, all kinds of stuff. So fortunately, I was able to find a surgeon in Switzerland um, that, you know, was willing to kind of try a procedure that wasn't um, that well known at the time. And um, it was basically my last resort before getting an artificial hip. Um, I ended up working out really good. And um, I actually, towards the end of that trip, or not the trip, but the, towards the end of my stay in Hong Kong, I started, I started getting good again and managed, managed to be the first um, person of kind of European or white descent to win amongst the whole Hong Kong kind of swimming federation kind of newcomer of the year or kind of the you know, most outstanding swimmer, which is probably one of my highlights in my, in my career because that kind of was something special because it hadn't been um, done before, especially being of, you know, not being Hong Kong born or Chinese born at the time. Um, but from there, it took me to South Africa, like you mentioned before. Um, there I swam with a guy called Peter Williams who went to the University of Nebraska for his undergrad and he was a great swimmer himself, um, broke the uh, 50, freestyle world record, but it was never um, recognized by FINA because it was during the apartheid era of South Africa where South African sports or athletes weren't allowed to compete internationally. So a lot of controver controversy through that. Um, but long story short, the plan once I set foot in South Africa was always, hey, Peter told me, hey, the goal for you is to go to college in, in the States, you know, because that way you can, you can get an education and you can do something you love at the same time. Yeah. You know, Dom, uh, you've, you've got this charisma and, 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 and you know that, um, you know, you've got, you've got a lot of things that, that I, I would love to kind of touch up on and, you know, uh, starting swimming relatively late in, in that injury when you're 13, like I, I bet that set you back a year and a half, you know? <laughs> um, I think you're right. I think you're right, but I think it prolonged my career. Believe it or not. There's that. And, and, you know, another thing that I, that I always, I always just really stuck out about you is you're not the biggest guy at, at the pool. You, you never were, um, you know, you're, you're about five eleven, six feet tall. Uh, I like, to, I, I like I, to round up to six feet. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I posted a photo of you on, on our, on our, on our social media, um, you know, our story and just to, just for people to see a photo of you and, you know, you, you were never, you were never very, very big, but one of the things that everybody can see about you, and even if, even if a spectator was sitting in the nosebleed or section, they can see a guy dive in the water and where he plants his hand, his hand is anchored right there. Your hand did not move and, and your body would move past your hand. So it was, it was almost like a perfect harmony with the water. You know, uh, a lot of people, you know, they fight the water, you know, they, they, they anchor their hand and then they pull their hand backward and the hand is passing their body. Right. Well, with you and, 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 and a lot of, and I would even argue very, very few key athletes with you, your body actually moved past your hand. And, and the way I knew this was I would, I would watch your race and I would see if you would plant your hand at the, at the white buoy mark and your hand would stay right there as your body moved just past that. And, and, you know, I, 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 I always kind of pegged you as somebody who was incredibly efficient. You're not the biggest, but you were incredibly efficient. Now, you know, there's, pre there's precision. And then there is, I always joke, Swiss precision, you know, which is, which is, which is <laughs> a dominant mitre. Did you, did you ever, were you conscious of, of the fact that you were never the biggest guy? And as a result, you kind of just needed to be more efficient and smarter than everyone else? You know, I, th I think it all kind of comes back to kind of my injury, right? So making, making the best out of 
out of a bad situation. So in my case, I was just pulling the whole time, you know, so I was really kind of working on my, on my upper body strength and my stroke because that's, mm -hmm. that's the only thing I could work on at the time. Uh, something that kind of stuck with me that I learned in South Africa was you got to treat the water like you would a person, right? You're not going to, you're not going to like be rough with a person when you meet them. You're going to gradually, you know, put out your hand, say hello and, you know, shake it firmly, but not aggressively. Right. So in, in that sense, um, he kind of told me that there's no, if you fight the water, it, the water's not going to be your friend. But if, you, if you're basically one with the water on it, you know, if it starts becoming really uh, foo-foo, but if, if you actually, you know, kind of treat the water with, with the respect that it deserves, it'll treat you well back. Um, and then in terms of size, you know, I mean, you know, I am, I'm almost 6'1", just as an FYI. <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, I, I noticed pretty quickly, um, you know, I kind of started puberty late and everything like that. So I was never one of the tall kids at all. Um, but that never, I never shied away from that. I never shied away from my size. I was never afraid of being the small guy. I remember um, my first world championships actually was 2003 in Barcelona. Uh, I wasn't, I didn't swim um, internationally yet until 2002. Um, but at that world championships, uh, I was in the 200 freestyle semifinal with Ian Thorpe. And at the time Ian had the, um, had the world record. And I remember after, after my race, the, the reporters were like, oh my gosh, you know, what was it like swimming, you know, Ian Thorpe? And I was, it started getting me thinking a little bit. And I started to realize that Switzerland kind of, it, Switzerland is a small country in Central Europe. Um, and we have something called the little person syndrome in a sense that we feel like we can't compete or can't be as good as some of the major players in a sport. Um, you know, like, you know, football or, you know, soccer in, in, in Germany or, you know, American swimming or Australian swimming. And so I, I said, I didn't care who was next to me. I just, every time I stood next to someone, or I always thought I could beat them. Always. I was never, I didn't care if there were, you know, six foot 11, if it was Michael, Michael Phelps or Ian Thorpe or yourself. I always, a part of me always thought I could beat you because I always felt that if you had an off day and I had a great day, the world's mine, you know, similar with if, if, if Michael had a, if Michael had a bad day and I had a phenomenal day and all stars aligned, I can beat anybody. You know, I, I wouldn't say I was, I wasn't the tallest, um, but I was never shy of racing people. Never. Yeah. And, and I your loved times it. were no joke. I mean, it was, was it a 145.7 or 146.7? That was your best 200 meter long course time. 145.8. Yeah. At the time yeah. it was the uh, eighth fastest ever swum. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I, I, you know, my, it's, it's funny. Cause I, I, you know, obviously I'm big fans of a lot of people that you brought on over the week and a lot of those individuals won Olympic medals, um, and, which is, which is awesome. And which, which was always a dream of mine. My, my best placing at the Olympics was sixth in, in 2008. Um, but to come back to something that a lot of your past guests touched on, it's the journey to getting there, which is, which is the most fun. You know, um, times, you know, get broken and records get broken, but the, t the memories you kind of create throughout your, your career or throughout the, the time that you swim or play a sport, that's what you hold on forever, you know? Yeah. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure you don't mind me bringing up that, you know, late last night, you know, Duya, George, myself and you, we mm -hmm. hopped on a call and we started talking about good old times, you know, and that's, we actually, you know, talked about on that, on that call saying, Hey, we need to do this more often because we brought up stories um, that, you know, we can only share in, in a form like that, but which make us laugh, right? Because yeah. it, it's all about the journey. And if, if there's something, and if there's one kind of note to pass on to people on this call, um, it's have fun with what you're doing because it, and at some point it ends. And, but the friends that you made throughout your journey, they stay, you know? So regardless, you gotta be, you know, you gotta be gr graceful in, what is it? You gotta be graceful in defeat and you've gotta be, you know, modest in, in, in victory. 
because these are your friends and you guys all have something in common. And I know I'm talking a lot, but something that kind of really clicked for me was, so I, I went to three Olympics. I went to 2004, 2008, and 2012. At the 2004 games, my coach at the time told me, hey, go to the opening ceremony. This was the same, the next day I had a race, but he said, go to the opening ceremony. Um, this is where you're gonna be. You need to take this all in because in 2008, it's gonna be your time to shine. So use 2004 as basically a stepping stone for 2008. And in 2004, I, I went to the opening ceremony and it was amazing walking into that um, arena and people were clapping. Now people weren't clapping because we were Swiss or we were American or Serbian or Croatian or Chinese. People were clapping in the audience because of the sacrifice and the journey that everybody um, put forth to make it into that big arena. You know, there, there's yeah. so much sacrifice, right? And, and you know that, you, you did that yourself. You know, I, I, I listen, you know, first of all, like a conversation last night, um, you know, and, and for everybody here, uh, the, the friends that you make today, you're, you're going to talk to some of them uh, 20 years down the road. And, and similarly with, uh, with our meeting last night, you know, uh, there was like this warm resonating feeling that, you know, that you have when you're with this group, uh, you know, you reflect on, on the good times, you know, there, it wasn't always good. <laughs> You know, no. uh, it, it, it was, it was hard. Um, but we, we got through it together. And, and I think, you know, that I kind of, I kind of want to talk more about that team aspect, um, you know, in just a little bit, but, you know, to touch upon that, that Olympic ceremony, um, you know, for me, when I, when I, when I kind of tie that idea to club swimming and age group swimming, um, making your first big final, it's uh it's 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 scary you know but once you once you do it and you you take it all in and you know what it is you know after that moment like you can you can you can transcend beyond that pressure and just do what you know what you've been training on and just do what you love um you know for me it was my first big final in 2000 and after that i was swimming next to my swim hero then and, and at that point, I, I thought after that race was done, I said, okay, well, that was, that was a whole lot scarier, you know, just in my mind, you know, when I jumped in the water, it was just like every other race, except with some pretty big names. Um, and, 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 you know, like you, I, I went to several Olympics and the first one wasn't so great for me, but every single time that I went back, it, I was just more and more comfortable just because I, I knew what the pressure was like. I, I knew what to do and I knew what I would do when I, I would get a little jittery and uh, it'd be at first, but once, once you do it enough, it's like, okay, well, I'm comfortable swimming here and I know that it's me against the clock, right? You know, sure. Uh, and, and just to say like, to be sixth in the Olympic final is a big deal. It's a big deal. You know, the ones that are remembered, uh, the one that is remembered is always the Olympic champion. The medalists have the hardware, but to make that Olympic final, you, you respect the, the whole swimming world just because you know, Dominic, you, you can, you can be fast, but if, if you allow the anxiety and the fear to, to, to get the better of you, you're, you're not going to do well. And, uh, and, and just to get into the final and to do better, it's, it's a really big deal. I, I think about my athletes, um, and and I can and I could definitely think of a few, the ones that better in in like a, in a in a championship final, even if it's not the time that they wanted, I I respect them just because they they overcame their fears and they produced the better than they've ever produced, right. and 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 I smile at that just because I know that they've evolved and that they're one step closer to doing it better next time because they right. know what that feeling is and they know that they have been their best in the final and they could do it again. Right. And look, um, I think, um, tell me, you know, take me, take you back to like, you know, your, your early days and, and, you know, you obviously, you obviously won a couple of races and, and you, you were that athlete of the year in Hong Kong, but what kept you coming back to the pool? Was it achievements? Was it the friends? Was it, uh, was it needing to prove something to someone or, or was it, was it, a uh, you know, your Swiss parents, you know, telling you like, you got to go swim and this is it. Yeah. Like, this is what you're doing. 
No, no, my was, parents, my, like? my parents, I mean, to touch on the whole parents thing, my parents let me do whatever I wanted to do. Um, they were, they were so supportive. They, they said, as long as I wanted to do something, they were more than happy to wake up at, you know, 530 in the morning and drive me to swim practice, if that's something that I really wanted to do. Right. Um, so I, I was very blessed and I've been very blessed to have very supportive parents in that sense. Um, but to in terms of what kind of drove me, it was a combination of teammates. Um, when I was in South Africa, I I was more of a an athlete. I was a, kind of a bigger fish in a small pond in a sense. I was probably on my club team. I was I was probably the, their best swimmer. Um, and so, but it was kind of it was kind of weird. So I would I knew that other people looked up to me at that point. And so what I really wanted to do was set an example for those those kids. So I was probably only a year, maybe two years older than people there. But um, I first wanted to set a good example for kind of the younger kids. But I also in my head wanted to prove something to the Swiss national team, because I was training in South Africa. Um, but competing for the Swiss national team, I would only go back for Swiss nationals, you know, once a year and then see all those people that made the um, national team at an international competition, maybe that summer or that fall for short course Europeans. So I would only see them a short amount of time, but similar, to, similarly to what I touched on earlier is because time is the same all over the world, you know, all they saw was like, oh, Dominic just went this time in South Africa or Dominic went this time, you know, there. So for me, I was, I always felt like I was trying to swim and race I always wanted to bring my best in front of my Swiss um, counterparts because I wanted them to see that, hey, I'm not doing anything weird down in South Africa. I'm training my butt off and here I am with you guys now and I can swim as fast as my times were wherever I was, you know? Um, so yeah, it was training, kind of, it was just kind of a weird in South thing. Africa, you know that, you know, the conditions for training in South Africa wasn't nearly as good as is how they had it in Switzerland, uh, right. you know, talking to Chad Leclos. You know, I know that, uh, you know, they have a 50 meter pool. The water was sort of green. There would be no lanes. It would be, it would be wreck hours. So people, were, you know, there were no lane lines. And, and he, I just remember him t saying that there were just people swimming diagonally and doing whatever, you know, playing ball in the pool. And, and you would be training, you know, uh, around them. I mean, this is the right. Olympic champion that still had to like swim around wreck right. swimmers just to get his workout in. Yeah. You know, what was it? Was the pool always warm? Was it too no. cold? You know, was, was it dirty? It, like, yeah, I mean, what we, was that we like? had two pools we swam at. We swam at like a high school pool in the summer, in the summer months, because uh, the weather would warm up the pool a little bit because it never uh, heated it or anything. Uh, but even in the summer months, it would, the water at, you know, five, five o'clock in the morning is pretty cold. Um, and then we also trained at a local gym. But we didn't have quite the extreme conditions as Chad Leclo had. Um, they were just different. You know, everybody had kind of has their little, their stories in, in terms of, of, you know, things that they, they had to overcome, getting to the pool or swimming in the pool, you know, do you with, you know, being, sh being shot at with snipers and, you know, every, everyone's just a little different. Um, for me, again, it was pretty, um, pretty straightforward. I mean, I didn't have to overcome too much besides my injury. My biggest thing was being a big fish or a big fish in a small pond and then making that jump to college where you had Olympic champ champions like Duya or Anthony Irving walking around, you know, or, or, or yourself being European champion, you know, all of a sudden being kind of a medium fish in a big pond. Um, so it's, at, at Cal, for example, I wanted to swim fast all the time so that I could get the, uh, the attention of the coaches, <laughs> to be quite honest. So I'd want to race you guys because if I was racing you guys and beating you guys, all of a sudden Mike or Nort would be like, hey, Dom's kicking your butt, <laughs> you know, um, or, yeah. or Bart for that matter. So for me, I, I always wanted to lead a lane because by leading a lane and, and being in the front, I felt like I was getting the attention that I wanted. And you, I mean, again, everyone's different, right? And, and me as an athlete, I liked attention. 
Um, well, let's expand a little bit more on that that idea of leading a lane. You know, like uh, when when you're in when you're a team like that, um, which which you were. Um, you know, I think for for all swimming in general, like you know, to lead a lane is a responsibility, and and there are people behind you waiting, wanting to to take that position. You know, it, it's a badge of honor. To lead. Right. You know, you always got to know what's going on. You're you're always racing, and and if the person behind you, or even the second person in another lane is going faster than you, he's going to rotate into your lane. You're going to fall back, and and the second person in your lane is going to go over to that lane. Right. So it's it's constant racing, you know, right. and and I love that. That's that was the best part. I loved racing in practice. I loved it. Um, that was kind of the highlight because that's what made things fun, right? I mean. Doing 100, you know, doing 10 100s on 115, you know, gets a little mundane. But when you have people racing and then all of a sudden you're going long course 101s from a push, you know, that's, that's fun, you know. And yeah. I, I didn't care. I, I would love to be – I loved being exhausted at the end of practice because then I knew I gave everything. Um, but coming back to it, yeah, everyone's gunning to be, to be in the front of the lane, right? Everybody. And especially – remember a cow in the mornings – I th look, we had eight lanes at speaker, right? Yeah. But four of them were for the women's team and four of them were for the men's team. So, you know, we'd have, what, roughly about 10 people per lane? Um, yeah. Which in the grand scheme of things in, in, in club swimming isn't very many, but it's, it's yeah, about 32 that, swimmers, so it's about eight persons per, yeah. per long course lane. Yeah. Right, which isn't too many, but everyone's gunning to lead the lane because that's where the uh, clean water is, right? Otherwise, yeah. you're in you're in mushy water and, and it's wavy and all kinds of stuff. And so, you know, the hard part is, especially if you're doing hundreds, you got clean water for the first 50, but when you're coming back, you better start digging real deep because all the other people are coming back at you. Yeah. Um, so I, I loved it. I loved being in front. You know, I loved trying to race and keep up with, with people that I kind of admired. I, I don't like using the word idolize because I feel like you're putting people on a pedestal. Um, when in fact, you know, it, you're somebody that I admire, but if I put you on a pedestal, that means you already have, for me at least, a mental edge over me. Um, and I like to admire you, but I still like to think that I can beat you. Um, and I am a very firm believer that hard work beats talent on any day. Um, so I, you know, was I talented? Yeah, or I don't think I would have gotten as far, but I worked hard. And I think a lot of people, once you get to kind of that international level, you know, they're, they're hard workers and there's something about them that differentiates them from the person that was second in their lane because they just wanted it that much more. Right. Yeah. It's uh, it's hard work beats, ta hard work beats talent when talent won't work. Right. That's what it um, is. Yeah. 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 And yeah. again, I loved attention. <laughs> I just gotta be honest. I loved when I, I love, and this is, this is kind of in, in the broader scheme of things, the fact when somebody says, Hey, good job, that just feels good. Right. Yeah. And that's, yeah. and that's not only in the swimming world, that's in the working world now. Right. Like I work for a big tech company. And when, when I close a big deal and my boss is like, Hey, good job on that. That just feels good. Right. Yeah. And when you're leading a lane or doing something that other people aren't, you're standing out from that group and people are notice that. Yeah. Right. And it yeah. also, it, it makes you a little bit more vulnerable too, because you're putting yourself out there a little bit and you could fail, but there's also that, that chance of succeeding. Right. And that chance of succeeding is what drives a lot of people like myself. Um, yeah. So, you know, I like in listening to you talk, I, I, I've, I've got, I've got a couple of athletes, but one, uh, and I think she's here, Lee. Uh, you know, I've told you, Lee, and, 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 you know, this is what Dom's talking about. Like, it drives me crazy when, when you see someone so good going second, third, or fourth in a lane. Yeah. You know, uh, when, when you got that talent, like we said, you know, uh, hard work beats talent when talent won't work hard. And, and it, it wasn't about, you know, her just not working hard, but it's like, you know, when, when you know you've got the quality, which you did, and you still do, Dom, uh, you know, through, you know, in business today, like, when you got that gift, use it take advantage of it just because again there are other people out there that are gunning for that spot they want right. that time they want that position they want to be on that relay and and, and again you know uh like i i see i see talented people that sometimes just don't step up to the plate right. and uh and 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 you know again you know you uh you were on a team with uh 
we had Rolanda Z and Buddhist. And this was a guy from Lithuania that was 10, right? Yeah, Nobody yeah. liked to swim behind him because you were talking about that choppy water. Well, it's really choppy behind a 6'10 giant. Well, um, not only that, it's about a little bit more when you're six foot tall. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, um, uh, Dom, like, you know, you've, uh, you, you've just had this harmony that you don't see very often. And, and, and I didn't know that you pulled that much after, after your surgery. Um, I had back surgery. Different people had different injuries. Um, right. You know, some people have shoulder injuries and, and what we did, uh, we right. kicked, we kicked a lot right. and, and it wasn't fun, but kicking that much, what did it do for us? Right. It made yeah. you a great kicker. Right. And, and your legs always found you, especially in that 200. You were, you were a really good kicker, Dom. Yeah. Once I got my legs back in shape. Yeah. But a lot of my stuff was upper body work. Right. And that's uh, what you were touching on earlier with being an efficient in the water up front. You know, um, it was really noticing where you were, you know, entering your water and then just anchoring that hand and just pulling it through, um, you know, with, with a certain harmony. So it wouldn't, you wouldn't slip in a sense. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, everybody has their challenges in, in, in swimming and that, and in life for that matter. Right. And, and something to touch on just real quick, cause you brought it on earlier is like, you know, when you make that first final that goes beyond swimming right because think of public speaking or you know talking to the audience right now um you know so, some of the kids that are listening in they might have a school project and have to stand in front of the class that's nerve-wracking too in its own way right and by doing things over and over and practicing and i'm sure a lot of kids can relate to this is that if you practice a speech or a project over and over and over again once it's time to do it it's actually at that present time, it might seem hard when you first get started, but once you get rolling, it's easy, right? Yeah. And then at the end, you're like, hey, that wasn't that bad. And then to bring that back into swimming, like, what do we do for those 20 hours a week? We're training. What are we training for? For that moment to perform, right? So yeah. it, it, everything- 20 hours per week. Well, I, in the end of the day, they, uh, they limit you to about 20 hours of official training, but, you know, 20 hours I, sure did feel like 28 hours. <laughs> I was trying to be, um, obviously, um, Coach uh, Milo, you know that I'm Swiss and I like to play by the rules and I am very neutral in, in when it comes to certain things. Yeah. Um, <laughs> throughout, throughout history. Yeah, yeah, you know, I, I, I got another question for you, Dom, um, sure. but as I ask it and you answer it, um, you know, people here, uh, if you've got questions, uh, please, please do write them in the, in the group chat. Uh, I'm going to call on you when, um, when Dom finishes. Yeah, there's, there's no dumb questions. Question. Please ask anything, um, you know, and as we kind of wrap up in a little bit, um, you know, you guys are, and if you're too scared to ask in, in a public forum like this, um, I, I am on Instagram, so you guys can hit me up there and shoot me a direct message. And I'm more than happy to talk to all of you. I'll, I'll message you guys, no problem. Um, something that I kind of, it was really important for me coming from Switzerland, from a small country, it was about being accessible. Um, and I feel like sometimes, you know, yeah, I'm a little older now. I'm, I'm out of the spotlight and everything. But, you know, we all have a little bit of wisdom that we can still give. Um, and if people are willing to listen, you know, maybe if you can touch on one person, that'd be awesome. One of the great things that the USA Swimming Foundation, not foundation, but USA Swimming does. So to take a step back, so my wife, Jessica Hardy, she has an Olympic gold medal. And what the Americans tell their athletes, they say basically this medal that you're bringing home, Yes, you're in possession of it, but it doesn't belong to you. Your job is to take this gold medal and bring it out into the community and have as many people touch on it or touch it as possible. Because if that can just inspire one kid, um, you know, it'll, it might change their life. Yeah. Um, so well said. With, with, with that being said, you know, I'm, and I'm sure all the other speakers that were on or earlier in the week are, you know, we're all accessible. We're all friends of Coach Milo. So if any of you guys have something, a question or a concern or something that you want to run past any of the past guests, you know, 
we're, the swimming community is a small, tight-knit community. And um, it's something that you take for granted. And I took it for granted when I was swimming. Um, take it for granted a little bit. But as I've kind of matured a little bit and kind of stepped away, um, I'm grateful for the friendships and, and the connections that I've made through swimming. You know, still being in touch with Coach Milo and some of the other guests that were on this past week. So I was going to ask you a question, Don, before you went off in this soliloquy. <laughs> um, you know, uh, please write out your questions. But Dom, uh, you know, what has swimming done for your life uh, in, in these the the thousands of tests that that you'd taken through swimming in practice and going to these finals and, and evolving from every final and taking that into practice into your business life. Um, you know, uh, people that have never been as tested as is is the average swimmer, even 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 age groupers. Uh, you know, you're every every day in every practice and every championship meet you put yourself through tests that your peers do not go through. You know, you're, you're hardened and you're tougher than them emotionally because you're putting yourself through these stress tests emotionally and physically. Well, for you, Dom, like what is, what is swimming done for, for your life uh, it, when you, when you finish swimming in, in the business world? I mean, you know, uh, I'm curious if yeah. it's, uh, if it's just kind of, on, on a, on a personal already. level, and I kind of touched on it just a, a tiny little bit. Well, and I'm not sure you remember this, but you introduced me to my wife. So back in um, Montreal, which was what? What year was Montreal? 2005. 2005. Yeah. yeah. 2005, you and I, I believe, got off the team bus and we walked past the um, Team USA um, I don't know, little area that, you know, all like nations have um, before the competition pool. And Jessica was, was laying on the massage table and you, you said, hey, Jess. And then I asked you like, who's that? And, and he's like, oh, I used to swim with her back in Nova. So I'm like, oh, just introduce us. So you introduced us. So what have I taken away? I uh, met my wife and I have two awesome kids <laughs> from swimming. But from- And you didn't ask me to be your best man. What's up with that? <laughs> you didn't even come to my wedding. <laughs> I was busy. I'm sorry. <laughs> and no, that's why you were my best I, man. <laughs> I, I, I bet, you know, um, I, I bet that all the tests just built you up in your confidence. You know, like, you know, in, in many ways, like, what did the confidence do for you? Yeah. I mean, look, after, after I finished swimming, I went to medical device sales and uh, was in the medical industry for a little bit. And swimming set me up for, you know, being ready and, and being, being in high pressure situations. You know, um, I was in the operating room with, with surgeons and when things didn't go that great, you know, I was able to problem solve under pressure. And that's stuff that we, we as athletes do all the time. You know, if you're standing behind the block and all of a sudden your cap rips or your goggles are leaking, guess what? You need to adapt. Um, yeah. And so honest, honestly, there's so many different variables in the outside world, but swimming gets you, your swimming actually can get you ready for the, for the world outside. Um, it's a- It can and it does. <laughs> it does, it does. Yeah. It's, look, it, it teaches you how to communicate with people when you're happy and when you're sad, right? Yeah. When, you're, when you're winning, things are great. When you're not winning, Guess what? If you're, if you're, for lack of a better word, a jerk, um, people aren't going to talk to you. And that's the same thing in the, in, in the real world, right? You got to teach, you got to, you got to be respectful to everybody. Everybody has yeah. a story and you need yeah. to be respectful of, of that person and of that story. Um, so, you know, throughout swimming, swimming has been the one constant in my life moving from, you know, country to country, but um, it's, it's the people that I've met along the way that have, you know, kind of taught me everything that I need to know for life and yeah. along with swimming. Well said. Let's, uh, let's jump into the, the, uh, let's jump into, we got a one, we got one question from Lee. All right, Lee, will you unmute yourself and ask please? Have you always enjoyed swimming? Like even through the surgery and stuff, have you actually like enjoyed it? Yeah. I think, thank you for the question, Lee. I think that um, 
everybody goes through ups and downs. And I think those are, those are normal. Um, I think that for me, at least when I had my injury, I kind of set it upon myself to want to try and prove everybody wrong and that I can come back from it. It was, a, it was a lengthy recovery process and it, you know, it took me years to get back to the level that I was at the time. Um, but it, again, like I said, way early on, I think it prolonged my career because I, during a certain time period, I wasn't swimming, fully swimming. I was just doing upper body swimming. Um, Did you think about quitting? Um, no, it never, no, because I just wanted to prove this, these doctors wrong. I really did. And one of the nicest things was, unfortunately, the surgeon passed away. But just before I, at Swiss, um, Swiss Olympic trials in 2012, I invited the, the widow of, of, of the surgeon to my 200 freestyle race in Switzerland. And I had won and qualified for my third Olympics. And um, I actually gave her the medal because he was the only surgeon that believed that, hey, this is an opportunity. Let's give it a shot. You know, he kind of put it out there and he took a chance on me and, and, you know, fortunately knock on wood to this day, I, you know, obviously a little bit of pain, but nothing compared to what it used to be. Man, that, that, that's awesome. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm so happy, you know, I'm happy that you're here and, and talking to us, but I, I, I think hearing that story, you know, uh, that's, that's you, you know, giving thanks to the people that helped you, right. helped you, help you do it. You know I mean? Um, I had back surgery and came back and this was when everyone was telling me you'd never race again. Um, yeah. and, and I, and I did think of the doctor when, when I made it back to the Olympics. Yeah. You know, I mean, two and a half years later, you know, you've got to be thankful for people along the road. Right. And at, you know, fortunately enough, um, I had someone there to that, that I was able to thank. Um, and it's, it's swimming is just, it's such a small part of our life, but it, it shapes us for our entire life. Yeah. Hey, Joey, will you uh, unmute yourself and ask your question? Hey, um, just quick question. Um, how do you overcome from the big fish to the small tank when you know that you're treating at Africa, that you're the bigger fish in the small tank, and you go to cows, kind of like a medium, and then to the bigger tank? Uh, mentally with that, I know that you say that you really competitive rather than that anything else and then how's your coach were like a prepare to you for that yeah that, that's a good question joey i mean like i said because i came from kind of a you know a small pond big fish and kind of and then moved from from that into a big pond some kind of medium-sized fish again why did i want why was i the big fish i wanted to be the big fish and get all the attention and so once i got into the bigger pond you know, I just had to think of other ways to, to get that attention. And for me, it was leaving the lane and working as hard as I could in the water. Um, mentally, you know, I always, I never really felt pain because I always thought of, okay, this physical pain that I'm feeling right now when I'm really, really hurting and swimming is nothing compared to the pain that I was feeling when I, when I hurt my hip. So it, it was something that, um, at least in my eyes, I could always, and even to this day, if, I, if something hurts, nothing ever hurts as much as it did when I really, really got injured. Because when we're pushing ourselves in training, yeah, it really hurts for that moment. But guess what? Once you hit that wall, it's, you know, the pain goes away for th those couple seconds and then probably comes back once you uh, have to turn on the jets again. But at the end of practice, you know, you can turn off and that pain goes away. You know, you, and I thrived off of that, that kind of temporary pain, the sting. Because I don't think it's, it, it was, I, I watched something earlier today and the person said, if it hurts, it's not good. If it stings, you're doing something right. Um, hmm. So, you know, how to overcome, overcome it mentally. I just always felt like I was out there to prove people that although I'm a little guy, I can keep up with anybody. Well said. Do we have any more questions? Dom, uh, do you do you have any anything anything that you would? There, there was another question in another meeting, and, and, I, and I loved it. Uh, if if you could write a letter to your younger self, 
Yeah. Uh, something that you wish you knew when you were younger. Uh, you know, and I'm talking, you know, 13, 14, 15, 16, just all up until you're 18. What is it that you wish you knew when you were just a kid? That once, because there, there was this time once, right after I broke my hip for the first like two, three weeks, I thought I was just done. You know, I was just on bed rest. I was in the hospital. And if I could go back. It's a pretty gnarly scar too. I mean. Oh yeah, it's, it's a good, yeah. it's, a, it's a good 12 inches long. Um, yeah. But it, if I could go back, I would tell myself, hey, stick with it. It's going to be okay. You're going you're gonna to do awesome. Just wait until what you can do, what you're about to do. And yeah. um, if I could tell myself back, you know, and say, hey, you're going to make the Olympic final, I probably would have just laughed at myself. <laughs> 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 um, and and that's why if I could go back I wouldn't say you're going to make an Olympic final I would tell myself I wouldn't say anything about what I'm about to or what I would achieve I would say is don't don't give up you know stick with it even during the hard times because you're going you're gonna to do amazing things wow well said um, Dominic uh, I, I'm, I'm going to ask your wife Jessica to join us you know, in a week or two. Uh, sure, I'm know. sure she'd love it. She's yeah, she's. Right uh, for those of you, for those of you uh, that don't know, just uh, Google Jessica Hardy. Uh, she, she's, she's definitely, she's had definitely had her ups and downs, just like all of us. And and she, she came out a champion. Um, we can't wait to hear from her. Uh, and and it's just kind of so cool just to see the two two together. I, I didn't know that. A small introduction from my side led to to you guys uh, getting married and, and having two great kids. Um, you know, I mean, again, that's you never know. It's where it all started. Yeah, yeah. And she'll tell you that. I hope if she remembers. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Dom, thank you, uh, thank you very much. Um, th this is great. Um, it looks like it looks like. Yeah, we got we got another question from Jean. Jean, would you uh, un unmute yourself and please ask? Were you always tired, even if? Were you always happy, even if it was tiring? Uh, that's a very good question. Thank you for asking that, Jen. Um, I, as as anything, it wouldn't be a journey with ups and downs, right? And so. For me to say that, oh no, everything was rosy and everything was so great, you know, it wasn't. Everyone, everyone's got a journey. And the, the fact that, and this is something that Coach Milo will probably appreciate too, is you start realizing what you've done when you can appreciate kind of your past a little bit more and can, can kind of take a step back. Um, I wasn't always happy. I mean, you know, I was always super competitive, but, you know, as in, even when you're competitive, you can have disappointments. Um, you know, I've lost races by one or two one hundredths, just as somebody else on this call has on, on, on a big stage. Um, but look, there's disappointments everywhere. And it, it's important to, you know, even when you're not happy, and I'm not saying like put a smile on your face at all times, but try and look at the bigger picture, you know, and if, if your journey or, you know, if, if, if your path is, is going to be at a national level or at an international level or the Olympics, that's fantastic. Everyone has their own path. And it's important to, to really take in that, that journey. And I know it's come up over and over and over again over the calls over this past week. And I know it sounds cliche, but it's something that you don't realize when you're actually in the moment until you actually take half a step back and be like, wow, that was awesome. And if I could, I would love to go back 15, I would love to go back to college with uh, coach Milo and, you know, and, and try even harder, you know, um, I'm sure I can think of times where I didn't give it 110% in practice and, but it, it's important to, you know, acknowledge that. And it's all part of the journey. Um, you're not always happy, but you're trying to make the most of what you have. I think is super important. Good. Sierra. Uh, hi, uh, how do you not stress about the uncontrollable things? Um, another very good question, Sierra. I think that um, you don't have control over 
the person in your right lane and you don't have the person, you don't have control over the person in the lane next to you or, you know, outside the pool, you don't have control over what project you're going to be given. You know, some of that is just predetermined. Um, but it's, it's kind of what you make of it. You know, if, if you're, if you're given an opportunity to compete or if you're given an opportunity to, to present, um, you want to try and present your best self, right? And anything less is a sacrifice to the gift. <laughs> um, so I think it's, it's, it's super important to, you know, not get overwhelmed by things that are happening around you and that you can't, you can't control. And I, th I think somebody that's really good to ask, and I, I hope Coach Milo really follows up on it. That's a great question for, for Jessica. Jess has been through a lot that she could not control. And um, I'm not going to go into her story too much because that's hers to tell. But, you know, we, I didn't have any control over breaking my hip. You know, and it, it's important to try and get positive, take positive things out of every situation. Um, I'm, I'm naturally a very positive person, except when I'm very, very mad at my daughter because she has the same temperament as myself. <laughs> um, but it's, it's just important to, you know, make the best of what, what you're given. And, and, you know, Coach Milo has been through, through his hard, hardships and I've been through, through mine and every one of us on this call will go or has gone through hardships and those won't ever stop. You, you're going to care. You're going to have that throughout your life. Um, I think, I think her, her question kind of related to, you know, this, this pandemic and not being able to train. Yeah, you know, it's out of your control. Yeah, you that, control yeah. what you can, what you can't control. You you just accept. Uh, you know where Nathan Adrian kind of said it the best. You know where we're all in the same boat. Yeah, uh, yeah, and and that comes back to the whole. You know that's why I reach out to to a person like Nathan. Reach out to myself or George or Duya. Um, you know we've all gone through things, and um, right now everyone's going through the same thing. Everybody. You know, the Olympics, what, what people have been training for for the past, you know, they say only four years, but I say their lifetime, you know, it's been pushed back a whole year. Um, everyone is going through the same thing and concentrate on one thing, maybe a day. I mean, I'm not, I can't, I'm not very good at, at giving advice, um, but I feel like if you just concentrate on one thing, one day or one week at a time, you know, it'll at some point it'll hopefully be over because God forbid I'm stuck with uh, Jess and the kids indefinitely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, guys uh, work as hard as you can and do what you can. Uh, at the end of the day, it's a choice. You know, if, if you, if you want to find a way to work out, you know, you're going to work out, right. but only and, if you want. And you're given the resources, right? I mean, I was, um, Coach Mila was uh, kind enough to kind of forward the email that he sent to the team uh, earlier today with uh, some dryland exercises. Hey, guess what? If you're noticing your core is is weak, get on those exercises. You know, the, the resources are there. The internet is there. People are people are posting workout ex exercises left, right, and center. Um, you know, just doing something. Um, if it's picking up a new hobby like reading a book or or Learning a new instrument. You know, it's all about just learning something. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I had to. I had to. I had to mute Elizabeth. Um, well said, Dominic. You know, everybody's doing something. The question is, what are you doing? And right. um, you know, you, you you control what you can. Everything else, you know, you just have to kind of accept. And and the great thing. <laughs> For, for lack of a better uh, phrase, you know, we're, we're all in the same boat and yeah. um, we're going to be fine. You know, right. We're going uh, to be fine. Right. right. Yeah. Dominic, thank you. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you for your wisdom. And, and you say you're not great at giving, giving, you know, advice. You give a lot of great advice. All right. Um, you know, again, the advice is now yours. Uh, everyone here, uh, what you do with it is entirely up to you. All right. Guys, uh, have a wonderful weekend. Uh, stay, stay safe, stay healthy, get active, and uh, you know, just keep the ball running. Just be positive. Yeah. All right. Thanks for having me, guys. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Coach Milo. All right. See you later. Bye bye.